It's a great pleasure to hand over to Paul Pritchard, who is going to give us a, an insight into where Pasma came from. Thank you, Paul Pritchard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was billed on the programme as a, a Pasma auditor, and I thought that's not the right way to get the audience on side. <laughs> um, it's a truly noble calling. I wouldn't knock being a Pasma auditor for anything, but. Uh, I haven't always worked on the dark side. <laughs> okay, so I thought I'd start by uh, giving you a bit of my own history and my credentials for running this Pasma History Project. So um, people were talking about being in the industry 30 years and things like that. I actually started in, in the industry when England were the World Cup holders. <laughs> <laughs> And we was robbed. <laughs> okay, I joined a company called Stevenson Carter in the early 70s, just as they were launching their first aluminium tower called Climaloy. And I think if I wave my hands, I think Gary might be able to uh, show us a picture of that. As you can see, that was uh, a cutting edge tower at the time. And like most of the towers back in the 60s and 70s, it was a stairway tower. Span towers weren't very popular at the time, so stairway towers are what we launched. Um, at the time, there were only three other tower manufacturers in the market in the UK, and believe it or not, they refused to sell their products to hire companies. <laughs> Stevens and Carter were one of the founder members of PASMA, and I represented them at some of those early meetings in the 70s and 80s. And um, I carried on for 17 years on both the council and the technical committee that started up after a few of them few years. I also represented Stevens and Carter on BSI committees, and dare I say it, NASC committees. <laughs> Names that should not be mentioned. And we usually met in someone's hotel room at the Excelsior Hotel in Heathrow. Usually when John Rustling was flying from England to Ireland, he'd book a room at the hotel and we'd all meet there and have a natter. And uh, we didn't have any staff, any support, and we each took it in turns to be treasurer, secretary, and chairman. So in those heady days, I was once chairman of four people. <laughs> OK, well, whilst the lesson's here, oh, we'll have a change of slide, if I may. OK. Uh, old fogey's back. Uh, while at SNC, I also launched the Climber Light Tower and introduced the GRP Genie Tower into the UK. So that was partly my fault as well. Um, and like so many people in the industry, I got made redundant in 1990. Uh. Uh, thank you. And uh, so I lost my plasma connection at the time. I tried really hard to avoid getting sucked back into this <laughs> terrible industry. But after about two years, I needed to pay the mortgage. <laughs> and I ended up working for Accent International, selling Climaloy, Zigzag and Highway Towers. <laughs> Some of the towers I've been knocking in my previous life, so nothing new there. Uh, but that didn't work out too well, and I didn't feel happy working for a large company, so I ended up working for a much smaller company called Alto that made the heavy-duty aluminium tower. <laughs> okay, it's worked. The waving hand has worked. Okay, uh, at the time, Alto weren't members of PASMA, so uh, I worked very hard, and after a couple of years, I got them to join, uh, join the... And I once again got the opportunity to sit, represent them and sit on the PASMA Council and uh, on the Technical Committee. And I also represented Alto on BSI's 1139 Part <coughs> 6 Committee. So that's partly my fault as well, OK? So I've got a lot to answer for. Um, I left there in 2007 and became a freelance PASMA trainer. If only I was earning a £1,000 a day. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, and... Uh, and then finally, as I approached the, the sort of twilight of my years, they said, why don't you come and join the dark side, move from twilight into darkness, and become a part-time plasma auditor? And that's what I did up until Christmas. Now I'm just the old fogey down at the bottom there. So how did this project come about and why? And uh, it started out, like a lot of these things do, with a a late-night conversation in the bar after you've had too many drinks. You know, you probably had this last night if you were here at the bar. Do you remember so-and-so? Do you remember when? Do you remember who we chatted about? Do you remember what he did? I wonder where he's working now, and, and so on. And, of course, we'd sit there and say, we must do something about this, and we must document it. 
and we never did. And this went on for probably about 10, 15 years. And then uh, as plasma grew, and I think you touched on it with some of your questions earlier on this morning, where are we going, what's going to happen next, why do trainers need to have refresher courses and things like that. And uh, we began to realise that um, we needed some idea of where we've come from to ha have an idea of where we might be going to next, what might be happening next. So what started out as a, a manufacturer's association representing just those four companies that I talked about now has got a whole range of stakeholders, thousands of members, you know, tens of thousands of people being trained. And you know, we're involved with training, guiding legislation. It wasn't always so. And will it always be like that in the future? So there's a lot to um, think about in terms of where we've come from, where we're going to. So about three years ago, we started the ball rolling. And some of you might remember this. I stood up at one of these meetings and put out an appeal for any memorabilia, old bits and pieces, stuff like that, that we could collect and start making an archive. Um, and thanks to everyone who responded. Particularly Roger here in the front, he gave me a load, a wealth of documents. Uh, Peter Bond provided me with a video, which we've, uh, an old VHS video, which we've had transcribed onto DVD. Um, but due to time factors, I don't think we've got time to run that today, even though it shows Roger and I building a tower, which is a rare sight these days, I can tell you. Um, Kenny Rogers, who some of you know, had minutes from the early training committee meetings and things like that. And um, Julian, our chairman, Chris Blanton, our former chairman, they all con contributed whole piles of paperwork. And I gather some of them have got more paperwork to give me today. So, great. Anyway, what we ended up with that was, um, a, even with all that memorabilia, we ended up with a big gap prior to the 1990s and nothing from the 1970s. Um, my, pa my memory from that era was patchy. You know, if you were there, you probably don't remember it. You know. Or was that the 60s? No, can't remember. And let's face it, we all slag off our competitors and we all have a slightly distorted view of the past. You know. We was robbed of that order. <laughs> we was robbed of that World Cup. You know, that's the way it goes. And uh, just to prove a point about our uh, industry knowledge, and to see if anyone's awake still, because there's a few people at the back don't look too awake. Oh, sorry, that's the auditor, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Let's see if anyone, is, not too serious this, but let's see if you can answer this question. Uh, in what year was the first alloy tower built? 47, 45, 47. Ah. A prize to this man at the front. 1946. And I'll come back to that when we look at the timeline in a minute. Uh, okay, don't answer this one, Roger. Anyone but Roger, where was it built? United States. Big place. <laughs> Anywhere more specific? Texas. No. Roger knows. Anyone else? Berkeley, California. Okay, who built it? This, this was something I didn't know until I started doing this history. We can pin it down to an individual person. <laughs> <laughs> not, not Roger, no. I'm not that old. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, Roger knows this. It was Wallace Wally Johnson, and he he designed it over the Christmas holidays of 1945 because he was bored, and the neighbour asked him, uh, you know, got any idea how I can do the back of my house? I really don't want to go up a ladder. And over the holidays, because he was bored, he came up with the original design. And I'll come back to that again in a minute when we look at the timeline. OK, what did those pesky Russians have to do with the early success of tower sales? This will, this will stump you, I'm sure. <laughs> You've got a nerve to say that. <laughs> now... Well, very early in the life of Alleman Towers, around about 1954, the US government decided they wanted 200-foot towers for monitoring Russian rockets. <coughs> so they put out a tender for 200-foot towers. And, uh, of course, the only one that was on the market that was really simple and light and easy to build was the one that Wally Johnson had built. So he got a huge you know, step up in the marketplace, a huge 
increase in production by supplying, uh, supplying towers to the uh, US Army Corps, I think it was. 204 foot high. I wouldn't want to have built those. And I've got a picture later on of how they did build them. Okay, coming a bit nearer to home now. What year was Plasma founded? 47. No. I was at the first, one of the first meetings. That would make me 70. 24. <laughs> 74. The late in 74, early in 75. And a CPD point for anyone who can give me the names of the other three companies, because I've already told you one was Stevens and Carter. Who were the other three founding companies? John Rustling. John Martin Thomas. Thomas. I'm not taking Roger. You're, you're, you know too much. <laughs> You probably heard Roger. It's, it was, uh, you know, upright. In fact, it was John Rustling in those days rather than instant. John Rustling selling the upright product. Now, here's one that will stump, stump me for a while. What was Plasma's original name? Now, some of you will probably remember this one, but can you actually remember it? You uh, it You can have a CPD point, George. <laughs> OK. And uh, I've showing you how patchy our knowledge is, and I, I, I don't know the answer to this myself, but I'm sure Peter will. What year did Plasma move to Glasgow? Because I need that for my history. That's put him on the spot now, isn't it? 2004. OK. You can have a CPD point too, Peter. <laughs> so... About a year ago, we took stock, and I went up to Glasgow. Um, I was uh, on holiday up there, popped in for the day, and I said, let's sort all these, uh, this archive stuff into, into boxes. How should we do it? And someone said, let's have a box per decade. So we had six boxes across the, the boardroom table, and we put everything into the different boxes as we went through it. At the end of the, end of the session, I went to the 1970s box, and there was one sheet of paper. That was the only thing we had from the 70s. And I thought, we're not going to get very far building this history job by just getting uh, physical objects and things like that. So uh, the only way forward to me seemed to write a history so we could document it all. And uh, with so many gaps in our knowledge, a Wikipedia approach seems to be the only sensible way of doing it. Because yeah, we've all got different versions of what happened. I'm, I'm impressed by how much knowledge there is in the room, but we probably all have different views on who did what, when, and how. So I thought, if I start the ball rolling by doing a sort of an initial history and maybe a timeline, then everyone else can go on the Wikipedia site and can say, no, you're wrong about that. And I had this conversation with Roger last night, and I said, you can probably answer this. When, what year did Eurotower start? Because I couldn't remember it. And he, he knocked me over by saying it was June... 6th of October, 6th of, 6th of October 91. And it was the day before his birthday, you see. So he was, it was his 21st birthday, and he remembered it well. Yeah. You can have a CPD point. Thank you. So I sat down and wrote my memory of the industry, and I sent the script off, script off to a number of long-standing people, people like Peter Bond, John Bungay, Brian Madden of Upright, Mike McGuire of you know, uh, Stevens and Carter and Access Equipment. And they came back with loads of information. And I also got some amazing discoveries. Obviously, I got a, a, DVD, a DVD copy of a VHS video <coughs> from 30 years ago. Um, believe it or not, one of the people I contacted still has the old slides that we used for the training back in the 70s and 80s, where you had a 35 mil slides in a and believe it or not, they are still in the original carousel oh, yeah. and sat in his garage. So there's some, uh, there's some interesting stuff. Some old, old um, calculations from the 50s, um, some old um, patent, you know, patents, copies of patents from the US and so on. Loads of stuff. So I sort of digested all that and uh, I'm now on the seventh version of my history. And I'm approaching 7,000 words, and I'm going to read it to you now. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, yeah, we're a bit late. So, uh, A wealth of information about the 40s and the 50s, sketchy about the 60s, 
it wasn't everyone. Um, a, good, a good amount about the 70s. We're thin again about the 80s and 90s. Um, and 2000 onwards, obviously, we've got sort of current documentation and stuff like that. Um, and the clear picture is emerging, really, of the interconnectivity between plasma, legislation, and the growth of the tower market. So um, what I thought I'd do, rather than running through all 7,000 words, I'm going to try and run through it and um, show you a timeline. And uh, you know, if anyone's got any comments, I'd welcome them now. Yeah, shout out. If not, um, you know, send some information to me later. <coughs> so a, a quick uh, run through the timeline. And this would be quicker than I was hoping, but uh, we're running a bit late now. So 1945, Wally Johnson designed his tower over the Christmas break. Now, this might be totally wrong. He, yeah, we've got this from a book he wrote, and we managed to get hold of the book. He went on to become mayor of Berkeley, California, and wrote a book about his life. So uh, Brian Madden managed to find the book and sent it over to me. So, but he could have been doing a Trump, and you know. <laughs> so let, let's find out. But uh, it seems pretty definite that over the Christmas holidays he designed the first aluminium tower. 1946, he patented it and put a load of money into building the factory. And that factory sold the tower, and it was called the Upright Tower. 48, the uh, Army Corps wanted 204 foot towers. That gave his production a huge boost. Um, 55, we, start, we started making aluminium towers in this country because William Moss, a big building company at the time, uh, set up a company called Access Equipment, making the upright tower under license in the UK. And that product was called the Zip Up Tower. And uh, Access Equipment was run by John Ruslin. 57, this is an area where I don't really have the connections yet. R.D. Werner took out a patent for a tower in the US. So I don't know quite how they, they were obviously a ladder manufacturer at the time. And I suspect the US Army wanted two suppliers. They probably wanted someone on the West Coast, someone on the East Coast. So there's a bit more research to be done there. 59, when the five-year agreement with, between Upright and William Moss was just about to run out, John Rustling left Axis Equipment and set up another production unit in Ireland, making Upright under licence in Ireland. So hence the Rustling upright connection. Sometime in the 1960s, I haven't been able to find an exact date, maybe someone in the room will know it, um, one of the ex-Axis Equipment uh, engineers left Axis Equipment and set up Martin Thomas. Okay. Any information, gratefully received. Uh, 1974, you're back to when I got involved. Uh, we started uh, manufacturing Climaloy. Again, it was designed by Mike McGuire, who came from the Access Equipment Drawing Office. So you can see a common theme emerging here. Everyone was leaving, expanding the market, because the original founders wouldn't supply the equipment to hire companies. So people were saying, blow that, we'll build it ourselves. And then, 70, end of 74, PASMA set up its uh, first meeting between the four original members. Gary, next slide. Oh, here's, uh, I promised, I'd, this is an extract from the original upright patent. What I should explain, if I can, is that the towers came in modular sections. You didn't have frames and braces, you had sections that folded flat. And each one would be winched up and plonked on top of the next one. Advanced gardener. <laughs> <laughs> Come on to those in a minute. Gary? So, forward to the next slide. If, oh, right, okay. Round about 74, the health and safety at work app was introduced. Was there a connection between PASMA being set up and the health and safety at work app coming in? Mm -hmm. You bet there was. So, PASMA legislation. Obviously, PASMA was driven by the legislation in those days. Then, in three easy steps, the click share slide came onto the screen. Um, my memory is good, but I'm not that good. Anyway, I'll do some of it from memory going on. 75. Um, 
W.C. Youngman's entered the market with their Easy Build Tower. And um, I wonder who, where they got their design engineer from. <laughs> the the um, access equipment drawing office. So we've got the Martin Thomas Tower, the Stevens and Carter Climalo Tower, the Easy Build Tower, all designed by people who uh, used to work at access equipment. Roger knows what's coming next. <laughs> I can't remember what comes next on the timeline, but uh, a little bit further down the line, obviously, um, other manufacturers decided to enter the market, including one called um, Zigzag. Yeah. And uh, Roger can probably tell me this. Who, who, who did he... Who did... The design? Yeah. Somebody from the access equipment department. That's right. Johnny <laughs> Williams. So we're getting an interesting pattern developing here. Um, I knew I should have put this uh, timeline on my, my machine here. You know that slide carousel you've got yeah. at home with the, all the little slides in it, with the projector? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, let's go back yeah, to we'll that. Yeah. Anyway, um, we'll forget about the timeline, shall we? Carry on. That's yeah. so interesting. OK, so we've got to about 75. We've got Youngman's. Uh, a couple of other people entered the market round about that time. Aliscaf, you might remember them. They, they started out as a re repair company, repairing access equipment. So they did a good repair job, and eventually they decided to make their own tower. And uh, some of you might remember that with the master rung, which then got moved on to work with the Easy Build Tower. And uh, so we move on. I'm stretching my memory now without a screen, you know. Um, we had a monopolies and mergers investigation of the industry back in the 80s, and the sales market for Tower was defined as 12.2 million pounds. And Youngman's and uh, Stevens and Carter and their parent company, BET, which owns Zigzag as well, had 60% of the market. So back in the 80s, 60% of the market was owned, controlled by two groups of companies. And, uh, of course, that just led to more people entering the market. So you had Iger Tower coming along, uh, and theirs was, I think, interchangeable <laughs> with access equipment, if I remember right. Is there a theme coming through here? And then, uh, so we went on. Uh, I left the industry because uh, I got made redundant, but uh, Plasma carried on growing. More people kept joining. Uh, we bought out the code of practice. Uh, training courses developed, and in fact they started before I left, they started back in the 70s, and I remember the committee meeting, the council meeting at the end of the year when we launched the, uh, the, uh, the training course, and uh, everyone, each company reported on how many people they'd trained, and I think it was uh, SGB Youngman's, who were a combined sort of operation at the time, said, we trained 83 people last year, and we went, 83? That's an impossibly high number. Yeah. How could you train 83 people? Don't believe it. You're fibbing. And that was the scale of our training at that time. Um, but gradually, obviously, the training courses developed. The uh, codes of practices became more popular. And eventually, we needed a part-time person. So uh, we took on a guy called Eric Abbey, who was the ex-production director at Stevens and Carter Malden. And he, in his retirement time and took on the job of uh, being part-time secretary. And we had people, Peter join, uh, Pasma engaged uh, secretarial support in uh, Leeds. Some of you might remember entrancing conversations with Carl about where your codes of practice were. I see a few people nodding. It was an interesting time. The monopolies and mergers. And then in 1990, Pasma produced its first training video. I've got a VHS copy. I've made a DVD copy. But with my grasp of technology today, I'm not even going to attempt to, to play it. Um, 1990, Access International formed. And 1990, was it 1990? 91. 91, I'm a year out. Uh, Euro Tower started manufacturing uh, their tower which was compatible with the zigzag tower. That's because I was selling zigzag and the customers thought our service was so rubbish. They went back to Roger and said, can you, can you help us out? Because Access International can't deliver the bloody, we were on 12 weeks delivery for braces at the time. 
And uh, when you go in and say, would you like to buy a tower? And they said, oh, yeah. When can we have it? 12 weeks' time. Thank you, Access International. So, uh, <laughs> 93, we're probably getting into territory that some of you are more familiar with now. Youngman's introduced the Boss Tower. 96, Youngman's acquired Access International. 1999, Plasma changed its name because they didn't want to be associated with just aluminium scaffolding and just three manufacturers, so that's where the current name came in. 2000, BS 1139 Part 6 was introduced, and I'm partly to blame for that, as I was sat on that committee. Then the working at height regs was introduced, uh, and HD 1004 became EN 1004 after 20 years of, uh, of uh, fund development. And that then prompted Pasma and the HSE to get involved with the 3T build method and the advanced guardrail. And then at dates, because I was, I was losing the world to live at this stage, obviously, Pasma opened its office in Glasgow. Uh, the Pasma Hiring Assembly Organization was set up. And then other events, the My Tower was introduced. Pas 250 came out in 2012. Uh, that became BS. 8620, and then this year BS 1139 was updated, and I know uh, Don's going to talk about the implications of that in a minute. So um, that's what we, where we are so far, and you can all help with this project. I mean, you, going around the room, you've all got snippets that could add to that timeline, and probably artifacts and bits and pieces that we can all help. Even brochures for your, the company you're working for at the time, technical details, stuff like that. And we, we've now set up a proper archiving facility in Glasgow. Oh, and again, please. Um, it, it, it looks a bit basic, but we've got somewhere decent to, uh, to scan, <laughs> to store, and to look. It's better than the garage where those um, bits and pieces of paper have lived for the last 50 years. So... Again, please. What we've got are things like all the multicolored codes of practice. Um, someone was talking last night about the old uh, cellophane overhead bits that we've got. Uh, and again, various other uh, training aids. And there's what interesting, there's some of the original members and so on. So. A load of information. Um, perhaps the most interesting thing of all is this video. Are you selling it? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll buy one. I'll, no, there's some politically incorrect jokes that I mustn't make about videos and people selling them on street corners. No, don't, don't even go there. So, um, but I am promoting it because I think it's the sort of thing we want to put on our website. Absolutely. But... We're going to have to put our do not do it this way <laughs> across the front. Don't do, attempt this at home because there's Roger and I in, our, in trainers. Oh, God. Building towers with single guardrails and no tow boards saying, this is a standard for safety. <laughs> Which it was in 1990. We've come a long way. Yeah. So what can we conclude from all this that I've rambled on about today? Um, like many other products, towers came out of satisfying a simple user need. <laughs> The military requirements gave the uh, market an early boost. Trying to control the market by not selling to higher companies, uh, that didn't succeed in the long term. All that resulted in was a proliferation of manufacturers. So trying to control the market in the long run doesn't work. Uh, Self-interest and common decency can make competitors work together and make a market succeed. Uh, safety legislation can drive product and market change. Product standards can expand the market. And this is where I'm giving Don a bit of a build-up here now for his next presentation. Um, operator trading is an essential element of that market growth. The market will embrace new products and services, but only if they see a benefit. And PASMA can be reactive, as it was in the early days, or proactive, as it's been in the last few years with things like 3T and advanced guardrails. So over its lifetime, PASM has gone from just, oh, we better do something about the health and safety at work at, uh, okay, let's sort 
you know, working on a hideout and come up with the right way of doing it. So, the ne what next? <coughs> Where next? The next se session's on legislation and its impact. Um, you know, Don's going to talk about changes to EM1004 that took 20 years to originate. Maybe you see this as a problem, changing e e HD or EN1004. But history says it should be an opportunity. See the build-up I'm giving you? It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm really <laughs> what about new products? Looking forward to the future. Um, I was thinking, what could we do? And then I thought, drone operator training courses. Why not? We can send the drones up. We can teach people how to drive them properly. Could be fun to audit. Uh, thanks for your interest. Anyway, that's the end of my session. Uh, the history and the timeline will be live soon on the uh, website. Um, there's been an investment in scanners and software, but please add to it. It's your history and it's your future that we want to sort of help and document. And who knows, maybe there's a book in it <laughs> and maybe a few CPD points. What do you reckon, guys? Yeah. Maybe. maybe, yeah. What more affirmative answer can you have than that? Okay, thanks for your time. Thank you.